What's up guys and welcome back to another video. This is my August wrap up. This month was not the best reading month ever, unfortunately. You know, I had some hits and I had some misses, so I'm still gonna take you through the ones that I didn't super enjoy, just so you can decide on your own if you wanna skip them or not. I think I read five this month, two on audiobook and then three, three, math, three physical books. Two of them were five stars. The other ones were kind of want want, not the best. I'm kind of a mood reader, that's the problem, is that I will just pick up what looks good or what I feel like I'm in the mood for in the moment without actually reading reviews. So anyway, let's jump right into it. All right, so I have my handy dandy book annotating journal. I say that every time. I think because of Blue's Clues. Didn't he say handy dandy notebook? I don't know why that's like my go-to phrase. But anyway, I have my handy dandy book annotating journal here. Um, and the first one that I read was End of the World House by Adrian Kelt or Selt, not totally sure how to say it. It was there on one of their tables, like one of their new release tables. It looked really cool, very brightly colored. It looked like a really fun summer read. The Mona Lisa's on the front. It's obviously about like the art world. Um, and after reading the synopsis on the inside, I was like, oh, it takes place in the Louvre. It's basically like a Groundhog Day type storyline um, and two friends get stuck in the Louvre and you know that's where they experience their time loop which sounds really cool it was not very good <laughs> it was 300 pages and that's not very long for a book you know like a normal fiction book it felt like it could have been a lot shorter I only gave it two and a half stars there were some good words in here like I love I'll always write down words that I don't know and define them but that was kind of the only thing that I really liked about it it follows Birdie and Kate they have been best friends for a very long time and they find themselves in Paris at the end of the world it's kind of a last hurrah one of them I forget which one it is but she's gonna be moving soon and they're gonna have to say goodbye you know it's sort of like their last thing that they think they're probably ever gonna get to do together um, and so of course Paris because you know, it's Paris. It didn't even feel repetitive in the sense that like, obviously their day is repeating because it's like Groundhog Day. It, that wasn't even the problem. I wasn't feeling super connected with either of them and I didn't really feel too much for their friendship. Not really sure why. I said there's a lot of what feels like extraneous detail happening um, instead of focusing on like, you know, the museum and what's happening inside. I felt like there was a lot of stuff happening outside of the museum in like memories of them. I guess I thought there was going to be more about art, like commentary on art and creativity because I read a couple of books this month and last month about art and living a creative life and so maybe that's what I was wanting out of it and then that's not what I got so I was kind of disappointed. I think I said this on Instagram but the blurb on the front promises a phantasmagorical thrill ride and that is not what I got. I'm not even really sure what book that that person was reading to make them think that like that was a good description. It doesn't really have, you know, an insane fast pace to keep you turning pages. There wasn't a, a whole lot about the art, so I'm not really sure. Yeah, it was, it was kind of a quiet novel. I said there were some beautiful quotes, but I felt like there was a lot of just plot that was really unnecessary. And I, I said I kind of felt like it was just the old imagine all the alternative lives we could be living if we'd made different decisions sort of cliched storyline. I felt like it was another one of those and I've just read so many of those. So, which if you're into that you would probably really like this and I would also recommend um, The Midnight Library by Matt Haig because that is exactly what that book explores. I felt like there wasn't a lot happening that was pretty disappointed. Next up was The Divines by Ellie Eaton, which I do have right here. The bookmark is actually not even at the end because I think I I mostly listened to this one on audiobook um, because it was another one that I gave two and a half stars to. It was not holding my attention. Um, this sounds like a really awesome dark academia, a group of girls who you know were sort of hellions at this school, this very prestigious, what was it called? St. John the Divine was the elite British boarding school that they went to back in like the 80s or 90s? 1990s, yeah. Um, and it moves between 1990s Britain and present day LA. 
wasn't what I thought it was gonna be. It wasn't dark academia at all. The setting was, and that was kind of it. So this would be light academia. So if you're into that, then maybe you would like this. Um, but myself and a lot of people on Goodreads, which I went back and read the reviews of after I finished it, um, said the scenes set in the present day felt really unnecessary. It kind of took you out of the main plot line happening um, in the 90s at the actual college. It's set up to sound kind of like the secret history or something like that, like a classic dark academia, like a student is murdered or something happens that's bad. Um, and then it's sort of like the fallout and you watch the group who you're following, you know, the group of main characters, you watch them sort of disintegrate and fall, you know, friendships unravel and their lives fall apart kind of thing. And that's not really what I got. Um, it was definitely more so like gossip girl, mean girls kind of vibe. I said it kind of felt like 350 pages of listening to some posh teen girls in the 90s complain about their very privileged lives. They were rude, they were petulant, they were completely uncaring, and so you don't really care about them because they're just rude and mean and rich and you're like, okay, well, you know. I don't really care about you because you're being mean, so. Which I don't think that characters have to be nice to be relatable, I'm not gonna go that far. But like, you gotta, there has to be some sort of redeemable quality. I guess you could say that there was in the main character, Josephine, um, cause she's like in her 30s now, and she's been kind of holding on to, you know, the, the dark secret. And so she does seem to have a conscience, unlike some of the other girls. The ending was just silly. I was like, really? Like, I think I said that out loud when the audiobook was over. I was like, that's it? Like, really? It kind of leads up to what you think is gonna be this like big climactic whatever, um, and it just wasn't. Next up was one I really enjoyed, and that is Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. Um, I've still got all my tabs in it because I definitely plan on picking it up whenever I need a little bit of inspiration and just flipping to a random one. Let's do that. A subscriber recommended this to me um, on my writing blog, which I can also link in the cards if you guys are interested. Um, and I saw it at a bookstore like the very next day and I thought, it's been on my TBR for years, maybe it's a sign because somebody recommended it to me and it's right there on the shelf. So I went ahead and snagged it. I was with my mom and she bought it for me, so thanks mom. She gives a really multifaceted perspective of what it is to, to live a creative life and all the struggles and fears and everything that you know you go through as a creative. So um, the page I flipped to, I'll just read this paragraph. Um, so this she's talking about the arrogance of belonging the sense that you should have a little bit of ego because you need that to feel like you you have something to prove and to, to find the motivation to continue your work. She says, often what keeps you from creative living is your self-absorption, your self-doubt, your self-disgust, your self-judgment, your crushing sense of self-protection. The arrogance of belonging pulls you out of the darkest depths of self-hatred, not by saying I'm the greatest, but by merely saying I'm here. Like I'm worthy to make a good painting or book or you know, whatever it is. So it's full of amazing, amazing quotes. Whatever the creative endeavor is that you may um, be attempting in your life, whether it's drawing or painting or writing a novel like me or you know, what have you, it was definitely inspiring. It was five stars for sure. A must read if you are, you know, if you consider, even if you don't consider yourself a creative type or a creative person, it's still full of inspiration and things that might make you think a little bit differently about life. The overarching message that she's kind of, you know, giving to the reader is like, don't take yourself too seriously. Art should be fun, you know, writing, whatever it is. Have fun with it, enjoy the process. Don't get so hung up on the end product and just focus on making, you know, enjoying yourself rather than making something amazing or the greatest thing ever, so. And I really resonated with that because I'm kind of a perfectionist, so yeah, highly recommend it. Next was another five stars, and that was, where is it? Omnivores by Lydia Millet. I love this book, it's so good, it's so weird, it's so short. It came out originally in the 90s, 
um, 96, I believe. Do I have it written down? Yes, came out in 96 originally. It won, no, it didn't win a Pulitzer, but it was a finalist for the Pulitzer. And it is a debut, which is crazy. It's so good. It reminds me of like, it reminds me a little bit of Night Bitch by um, Rachel Yoder. This is like, I imagine Este, who's the main character in this, growing up to be, who's, what's her name? Oh, it just says an ambitious mother. Oh, I think she remains nameless. Yeah, I imagine Este, the main character from Omnivores, growing up to be the mother in this book. Um, because she deals with a baby who like, or no, she thinks she's starting to turn into a dog. Hence the cover, like the raw meat on the cover. Um, and it's like a metaphor for like motherhood and um, raising a baby, like raising a crazy toddler. And anyway, it's really good. But this almost feels like a prequel to that. So if you read Night Bitch, I feel like this would be a sort of prequel in a way, even though they're totally not related. So this follows Este, she is living in LA. Is it LA? I think it's just California. So the blurb for this one is short, so I'll just read it. In a claustrophobic, surreal California house, teenager Este Kraft lives with her domineering father whose obsession with insect taxonomy bleeds into sadism. As his schemes multiply, Este's bedridden mother, entranced by the glow of the shopping channel, remains oblivious to the escalating chaos. Este manages to escape her childhood home, only to find new horrors awaiting her in marriage and motherhood. In a climactic twist, her traumas take form in flesh and blood, a legacy of the insatiable male appetites that have haunted her life. I love the cover too. I only realized recently <laughs> um, that the top row is teeth and the bottom row is chains, which is definitely a metaphor. It says it's an explosive satire that scorches our culture's monstrous men and institutions. It's definitely kind of a feminist coming of age. Um, she's living in a house with um, a father who is abusive, so trigger warnings for abuse, mental and physical, um, also animal abuse. So if you're like me and you're vegetarian or you just really like animals, it's a little rough. Some of the scenes are there, yeah, they're a little intense, so just fair warning. But she lives in this really abusive household. She just wants to escape. She wants to get out. And her chance finally comes along um, in the form of like a business partner of her father's who like offers to keep her off the street. She's so naive the way she was so sheltered that she doesn't realize things cost money and you have to have a job. So one of her father's um, like coworkers or businessmen um, is like, well, you can stay at my place. I don't want you sleeping on the street. Um, but then that obviously turns into a whole situation. I'm not gonna spoil what the part is where it says her traumas take form in flesh and blood. It gets pretty weird, um, but in a really fun way to read. It's, it is pretty dark. It's funny because she will explain people um, in terms of like scientific inquiry. And so that's the way that she kind of understands the world is through like, by defining and documenting and like analyzing behaviors of things. So she sort of views people as animals in a way or like as specimens. So Este's perspective is very, very unique, um, very interesting. It's one of those that is, it is satirical and there are some moments that are almost laugh out loud funny, um, but it's also dark. So it's one of, it, it almost reminded me too of like Chuck Palahniuk, if you've ever read him, he's so funny but it's so dark. Like you kind of have to have a strong stomach if you're gonna read Polinic. And this reminded me a little bit of that. I got a little bit of that Polinic flavor. If you're a fan of him, you might like omnivores. And then lastly, I did listen to the audiobook for A Deadly Education by Naomi Novik. This is one I've had on my list for years. I've been wanting to read it for so, so long. I was really looking forward to it. I think I gave it like a three stars. I wasn't, I maybe should have known because I wasn't obsessed with her other one, Uprooted. I read that one, was it this year or last year? And I remember not being super like obsessed with that one either, even though again, Uprooted had been one that was like on my list for a really long time on my TBR. So A Deadly Education follows um, Galadriel. I believe that's her full name. Um, and she, it's, it's very much like a dark academia kind of story. She's going to this school um, called the Scholomance and there's all sorts of 
dark creatures, kind of like, you know, it's very kind of Lovecraftian or maybe tries to be. A lot of the students will go missing. It's very normal for students to just like die, to just like disappear and then you never see or hear from them again. Very much like Dark Academia from the cover too. I was like really excited for it. Um, and it just felt like exposition the whole time, like almost the whole time, even up to like the 50% mark. Cause you know, it'll tell you on an audiobook like how much you've listened to. And even halfway through, I was like, this still, there's so much world building. The whole thing kind of felt like exposition. I mean, right up almost until the end, which maybe would make the sequel more enjoyable now that there's been so much world building in the first one. So maybe I'll read the sequel. Probably gonna read reviews first before I do that. And it felt a little bit like a ripoff um, of City of Bones, the Cassandra Clare series that was like huge. Like there's a movie and a TV show. Um, I read a couple of those books years ago when I was a teen and then I loved the movie and the TV show. And there are some similarities that I was like, mm. there were some words in there. Like there's the enclave, like isn't that something that's in the City of Bones world. Um, and then mundanes, that's a word that Cassandra Clare uses to describe like humans or people without any sort of like magical powers. There's a character named Magnus, just like there is in City of Bones. So I mean, it, it wasn't like plagiarism or anything, but I was like, okay, was she like pretty heavily influenced by City of Bones? Cause it kind of felt like there were some there were some similarities I feel like that were that were pretty obvious and then you can kind of assume that it's gonna be sort of an enemies to lovers kind of trope um, with her and Orion Lake who is the sort of star um, demon killer or whatever you want to call him of the school he like saves her life multiple times and she gets annoyed because you know she doesn't want to be rescued by a man or whatever the relationship stuff that happens between them doesn't happen until a lot later it was a lot of telling not showing so like when you when you're writing you know the whole thing is like show don't tell like don't tell me that she's sad show me like the pillow that's soaked in tears or whatever you know you're supposed to you're supposed to show the reader not tell the reader and i felt like it was a lot of telling it was just a lot of telling so i didn't really enjoy the writing that much if you've read the second one let me know because I need to know if it's worth the read. That is it, that is everything. Just those five, wasn't a huge reading month, um, but I'm already having a better September. Let me know what you guys read in August and if it's something that I should read because I'm always adding things to my TBR much faster than I'm reading them. Definitely check out my reading vlogs, my writing vlogs. Well, I have one writing vlog, there will be more to come. So I'll keep you posted on that. Definitely like, subscribe, do all that fun stuff if you would like to because I've got a lot more fun things headed your way. So yes, thank you guys for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.